Yeah, really, really looking forward to this conversation. I find it quite extraordinary that Douglas and Jamie haven't spoken before, certainly not uh, recorded. I don't know if they had any secret chats in the last few days that they haven't told me about, but... Um, so I'm just going to do a very quick introduction. Um, and as Ali said, the, the format of this will be... Uh, Jamie will speak for about uh, 10 minutes to introduce the topic, then Douglas will speak for about 10 minutes to introduce the topic, then we'll bring in the unpanel question that we've already worked on, and that will be an opportunity to go away and work on an answer, which we'll bring in later on in the session after Douglas and Jamie have dialogued with each other for a bit. So, yeah, there's so many similarities between Douglas and Jamie's work, and I'd say that they're two of the, the most interesting and significant cultural historians on the intersection of psychedelic culture, tech, and the sort of the mainstream culture at large. So Jamie is a longtime friend of the channel, and he's the author of, I'd say, the main guide, modern guide to transformational culture and flow, Stealing Fire, the creator of the Flow Genome Project. And he's, we, I think we've done about, oof, eight or nine films, I think, with Jamie now, ranging from the pitfalls of psychedelic culture to sort of big transformative narratives. Like he's, a, he's a real polymath thinker, and I really appreciate how he brings together this sort of really intellectual depth with an embodied transformational part with a real sense of integrity. And so, Jamie, the, the topic here is building team human, and it's one thing to build team human when... We've got a lot of things working for us. It's quite another thing now to be looking to build team human or, as you've talked about, homegrown humans when it seems that everything is kind of falling apart at the same time. Would you like to frame how you, how you see this? Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm happy to. And I think what I'd love to do is, is anticipating the conversation that uh, we'll all get to have together uh, after Doug has also jumped in as we get to kind of frame this. I think the highest level question that we've kicked around together is, is like, how, how do we get to a place of heightened coherence and coordination? How, do, how are we at our best when everything around us appears to be at its worst? So that's the inquiry for our, for our time together this afternoon or evening or wherever we are. But to kick it off, uh, I wanted to actually read uh, an excerpt from the introduction to the sequel to Stealing Fire, which I am writing right now. And it's called Recapture the Rapture. And uh, the reason is because uh, Doug uh, ha has already had a, a direct influence on this. I remember I I've been following uh, Doug's work for probably 15 years or more. And if anybody's not already familiar with his stuff, uh, I would put him you know, on the short list of considered thinkers that are both participants in uh, the emerging edge of culture and also have a rigorous scholarly and academic perspective on it so that his passing and framing of things is exquisite. Um, and I always, the bonus of following Doug and also Eric Davis, who has either already gone on or is about to, but either way, like I see them in a, in a shared boat, which is um, they give, they, they've given me about a sort of five to 10 year sneak peek as to what's coming around the bend. So when Doug published this piece a couple of years ago, it was so spot on with the work I was doing. I was like, oh, fucking hey, this is an awesome story. Um, I have to uh, re retell it uh, um, to, you know, it, and put it in context with this bigger question. So I'm just going to read you guys uh, a couple of pages uh, from the introduction of this book that will be coming out next year. So in the summer of 2018, author Douglas Rushkoff, uh, Throwing Rocks the Google Bus, named one of the world's most influential intellectuals by MIT, wrote what amounted to an update on Evan Osnos's New Yorker essay from the year before. And in less than 18 months, we'd moved from the hypothetical to the nearly unthinkable. Rushkoff received an invitation to address a bunch of Wall Street financiers on the future of technology, a topic that he had spent his entire career tracking. And while he usually turned down those kinds of cushy speaking engagements, he was a founder of the cyberpunk movement back in the 90s after all, he admitted that it was by far the largest fee I had ever been offered for a talk, about half of my annual professor's salary. So he swallowed his disdain, did what most reasonable people would, and took the gig. Rushkoff showed up on the appointed day in what he assumed was the green room, the backstage place where speakers and hosts usually congregate during conferences. Five impeccably dressed men sat down and introduced themselves. Slowly, Rushkoff realized this wasn't the green room. 
and there was no stage. There was no auditorium full of traders waiting to hear him talk either. These five men were his audience. At first, they asked him a few easy icebreaker questions. What was the deal with blockchain and cryptocurrencies? How far off did he think quantum computing was? Can Google really upload Ray Kurzweil's mind to the cloud? Alaska or New, Ze or New Zealand to escape global warming. But then came the real question, the one those five titans of Wall Street had paid north of $50,000 an hour to learn. How do I maintain authority over my security force after the event? That sentence requires some unpacking. Let's start at the end and work backwards. The event. That was their euphemism, Rushkoff explains, for the environmental collapse, social unrest, nuclear explosion, unstoppable virus, or Mr. Robot hack that takes everything down. By this point, discussing debating or wondering about future scenarios had given way for these men to a chillingly simple placeholder, needing no modifiers or further explanation, simply the event. And while these men may not have been willing to bet on which particular domino would fall first and spark a chain reaction, that they would all topple soon after seemed self-evident in their analysis, a fixed constant in a more complex equation they were still trying to solve. Next, the verb, maintain authority, carries the distinct implication that A, authority might be challenged or questioned in the near future, and B, that those five men had it and intended to hold on to it. Finally, the object of that action, the noun, my security force. Not my personal assistant, not even my body man, butler, or team. My security force, unvarnished, plural even without an S. And judging by the urgency of their $64,000 question on how to control that group after the event, possibly mercenary. For the remainder of their allotted hour together, those hedge fund managers laid down a few more of their cards to Rushkoff. How would they pay their paramilitary if the economic system collapsed and paper and digital currency became worthless? How would they prevent a Lord of the Flies style coup once things went pear-shaped? Would secret combination locks on food supplies work? How about shock collars or AI robots? That's when it hit me, Rushkoff said. At least as far as these gentlemen were concerned, this was a talk about the future of technology. Taking their cue from Elon Musk colonizing Mars, Peter Thiel reversing the aging process, or Ray Kurzweil uploading his mind into a supercomputer, they were preparing for a digital future that had a whole lot less to do with making the world a better place than it did with transcending the human condition altogether and insulating themselves from a very real and present danger of climate change, rising sea levels, mass migrations, global pandemics, nativist panic and resource depletion. For them, the future of technology is really about just one thing, escape. To his credit, Rushkoff challenged their assumptions. In response to their blunt questions, he answered that the best way to maintain the loyalty of their private security force was to start treating them really well, like family, starting now, and to not stop there. Echoing PayPal founder Max Levchkin, he suggested they do the same in all their current businesses on this side of the event. The more effectively they could do that, he suggested, the greater the odds we could all keep the wheels on civilization in the first place. They were amused by my optimism, but they didn't really buy it, Rushkoff admits. They were not interested in how to avoid a calamity. They're convinced we are too far gone. For all their wealth and power, they don't believe they can affect the future. They are simply accepting the darkest of all scenarios and then bringing whatever money and technology they can employ to insulate themselves, especially if they can't get a seat on the rocket to Mars. The result will be less a continuation of the human diaspora than a lifeboat for the elite. Rapturists, every last one of them. So while it's tempting to marginalize those who embrace rapture ideologies, to think they only show up preaching fire and brimstone or wired up to suicide vests, the stark reality is they're all around us, wearing black mock turtlenecks and fleece vests, 
chatting on iPhones, speaking at Ted and Davos, tuning into Doomsday Preppers on cable TV. So, A, huge hat tip, Doug. Awesome. And thank you. And B, um, I just want to kind of com conclude this with the definitions. I think we all need to become end times literate. So to do that, I want to kind of introduce and define three key terms that typically get mumbled and jumbled and lumped together, which is the rapture, Armageddon, and the apocalypse. So I just mentioned rapture ideologies there, and I want to define how the working lens that I've been using for that, which is that rapture ideologies, again, whether it's traditional and fundamentalist or whether it's techno-utopian, share actually under the hood four unifying characteristics. It's that the world is fucked. There's an inflection point coming soon. Me and mine come up roses on the other side of that inflection point. Therefore, let's pin it and get there as fast as possible and never mind the collateral damage. Now, the problem with rapture ideologies, is, as you can imagine, is they're all one percenter solutions, right? And whether that's the morally virtuous or the saved, whether that's the billionaires with the ticket to ride, whatever the grouping is, right, it omits and excludes 99% of us. So the question here is how, as the world is being hijacked, and this is Yates 101, right, from the second coming, the best lack all conviction, he wrote, while the worst are filled with passionate intensity. So how do we recapture the narrative around the rapture? And how do we insist on all of us or none of us solutions? Because no matter how tempting a rapture ideology may be, and it could be blockchain, it could be psychedelic renaissance, right? You name it, we're, 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 we are susceptible to them all. And John Gray at the London School of Economics has, has made a powerful case. So there's a book, Black Mass and the Death of Utopia, where he argues that all of these, including communism, including all of these things, are alpha and omega Judeo-Christian exit strategies. So how do we make a deep and profound commitment, all of us or none of us, and recapture both the uppercase rapture, right, the end of time, and also our lowercase rapture, right, our passionate conviction. So that's the first thing. We need to recapture the rapture. But the next is the apocalypse. Right? And I think I already heard this in uh, Jordan and uh, Nora and John's talk this morning, which is, you know, apocalypticus from the Greek literally means the revealing or the unveiling. So while we want to reclaim the rapture and say, not so fast, one percenters, right? Those are all sociopathic solutions to a collective problem. We need to actually accelerate and bring about the apocalypse, the unveiling, so that we can see clearly, Right? And the final one is Armageddon. Armageddon is actually the end time battle. This is, this is Sauron and Mordor. This is the battle of five armies. This is where it all goes down. So the question here is how can we recapture the rapture? How can we hasten the apocalypse? And how can we forestall Armageddon for as long as possible? And I would propose that the solution is the thing we're here to talk about today, which is all of us coming together in a vitalized, connected, courageous team human. So with that, Doug, we'd love to pass it on over to you. Great. Thanks, Jamie. That was a, I mean, you've, you've done my job for me of a wonderful introduction to, to Doug already. Um, I will recap a, a little bit of, of what you so beautifully laid out, Jamie. Uh, Douglas, um, as Jamie said, you've been named as one of the top 10 uh, most influential intellectuals by MIT. You're the author of many books, including Future Thought, Shock, and Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus. You, you coined terms like viral media. And your most recent book, Teen Human, was a real, you, you described it as a mic drop moment of how do, we, how do we recapture these human values from the big tech companies, having sort of tracked them from the early kind of utopian Silicon Valley days into a quite sort of what we might call a dystopian present. And I've only met you a few times, Doug, but I've really appreciated your, you're a real ambassador for Team Human with your authenticity and earnestness of inquiry. So I'm really looking forward to, to seeing you and Jamie in dialogue with each other. Would you like to do your quick intro and then we'll get into the unpanel question? Yeah, I mean, lately I've been, uh, 
I've been questioning my own uh, identity as a so-called progressive and the whole notion of progress. I mean, in some ways it might be, uh, it might be Jewish guilt talking, but uh, the, the, the Judeo-Christian tradition was to really take a circular civilization and make it linear. You know, with the invention of text, we had the ability to write history and the ability to write contracts into the future. And it was a beautiful thing. And we decided once we could write things down, the first thing we did was we wrote down the law. We wrote down ethics. We thought we would use writing to make this year better than last year and next year better than this year. And we moved from a circular understanding of the world, uh, in, an indigenous understanding of the world as, as a series of cycles to we're going to actually get somewhere. You know, the Jews, we're going to bring on Moshiach. You know, there, there is a God, one God, probably a guy up there somewhere. And yes, God is all powerful. And the reason why the world isn't perfect yet is because there's this thing called linear time. And once the story unfolds, we'll get to that, um, we'll get to that perfect moment. So let's all keep working. Eyes on the prize, you know, uh, 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 pedal to the metal, ends justifies the means, arm in arm, we're going to uh, uh, vanquish everyone who resists us until we get to that, that promised wonderful place. And you know, that's what got us in this mess. You know, that's what got us into the, into the industrial age and now into what I've been calling digital industrialism, that we're applying digital technology to this scaled industrial age, exponential, market-based, you know, uh, uh, universal solution. And where I get concerned is when those of us who see the fallacy of that approach when we adopt some of the same language. How are we going to unite as a planet, all the people and figure to take down global capitalism? You know, how are we going to, to uh, uh, create the scaled golem to fight the institutional, uh, the institutional evil out there so that uh, uh, we look for scaled universal solutions to these scaled universal problems when I'm coming to believe that the answer is not scaled universal global solutions at all, but extremely particular local, uh, 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 highly, highly uh, uh, I individual and distributed solutions. That, that the response to globalism is not a universal revolution, but a highly local thing. You know, the, the, uh, anything universal, as far as I'm concerned, anything universal is, is highly abstracted and divorced from on the ground reality. And the, the kinds of solutions we need are going to be real tiny ones, ones that we probably get no credit for, ones that, uh, you know, th there's not going to be a, a book title. It's, it's, it's a different approach. It's not saying everything is fine the way it is. I'm not saying that. There's a lot of problems in the world. But the way, the way out is, is not necessarily uh, by uh, erecting something equal and opposite to, to, the, to the, problem that, the problem that we're seeing. Now, I was, I was watching a television last night, the, uh, the, the police strategy in Minneapolis versus the police strategies in Atlanta. In Atlanta, they had all the fires going off and the police were making ancient Greek phalanx formations to, you know, to hold the line. And in Minneapolis, the police and National Guard, they just vanished. <laughs> they just went, they were nowhere. And eventually it's like the people were marching in a, and eventually it was like, how could you have anything but a peaceful protest when there's no resistance to you? When they actually, when they, when they left. And on a certain level, not that we can ignore oppression. No, we can't. But, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking the way we, we, we take back uh, reality is by taking back the land and our time and our power and our value and our, and our exchange we, uh, very uh, locally and interpersonally. You know, the, the, the one... I, I, the one regret I have in calling team human, team human is that the most common email I get is 
how do I join? How do I join Team Human? And I'm like, dude, it's almost always a guy. Dude, you're already on Team Human. You know, you're, you're one of us. I was like, well, where do I go then? How do I, you know, how do I go? You go to your own town, your own school board, your own uh, land zoning commission, your own uh, 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 that that the way that the way to do this is going to be scaled to the human body, not to the the, the abstract universal uh, uh, organization or institution that we long for to fight to fight this battle. Um, to fight this battle for us. It sounds like a cop out, but it's actually harder to do moment to moment, eyeball to eyeball, choice to choice um, in your community. And I think that those will, they won't, they won't scale up as such, but they will, they will ripple. They will um, create a different, uh, different experience of reality for so many of us. You know, the, the, the problem with the billionaires was and and I wrote about it in that piece too. Was that what they're trying to do is to earn enough money to insulate themselves from the reality they're creating by earning money in that way? You know, they're trying to build a car that drives fast enough that they can escape from their own exhaust. And what they've realized is, it's impossible. That they're coming for us. That I can't insulate anymore. That this is going to blow. So they're looking for, you know, the, the bomb shelter. It doesn't work. And uh, uh, I'm, lo- I'm looking toward the opposite. How can we individually, moment by moment, small choice by small choice, make the world a place that we don't need to insulate ourselves from it, that we don't need to look towards this future day when everything will be okay, to decide, right, this is fucking it right now. This, we're, we're living it. There's nowhere to go. So what do you do then? What do you do if this is really it? All you can do is change your behavior, your approaches to the way things are. And, and for me, that's become, that's become the solution. I'm kind of going offline in some ways. Become, I, that's why I call Team Human a mic drop. It's kind of like done. You know, I've said more than anybody should, should be allowed to say um, in, in one lifetime. You know, so, so move on and just be a nice person now. Thanks, Douglas. Well, I hope we get at least another hour out of you before you decide <laughs> to drop the mic for good. So Douglas and Jamie have been working on a question. How do we build team human in a post-pandemic world? So yeah, so for me to to, uh, to unpack that question, and by the way, uh, Doug, I share it. I mean, this morning I woke up with a heavy heart and I'm like, oh man, what's the fucking point? You know, like (laughs) what on earth can we possibly say (laughs) that can begin to wrap our heads around any of this stark raving dumpster fire of, of a world and clever thinky thoughts are clearly insufficient. Um, so just to, to fully emphasize that whole, I mean, it's a total hackneyed cliche of the think globally, act locally. But the flip side of it is, is it's actually highly pragmatic mm-hmm. because if we lose basic, you know, basic food security, physical security, you know, uh, connectivity with our neighbors, all these kinds of things, we just go down through Maslow's, you know, floorboards. And the most aspirational goals for collective coherence or whatever you want to call it, um, simply uh, is just an elective option we don't get to play. Um, And so the idea of sort of dusting off uh, communal community and communal support and resiliency and self-responsibility does feel an essential part because like we can't control it all. We can't make sure of governance and politics and macroeconomics and multinational corporations. We can't turn all that on a dime. But unless we look after ourselves and get sorted there first at the personal, at the familial and at the community level, then we don't stand a chance of playing any of the other games. So I did see somebody in there saying, as Doug, you were commenting of like, oh, this sounds like Jordan Peterson's Mm -hmm. clean your room, um, but just with a, a more liberal bent and, and I would actually say sort of kind of, but it's not about personal morality in this case. It's about connectivity, viability, and anti-fragility. And those things, I would just say, right. hey, absolutely, let's get on that because we are atomized, fractured, rash, like hyper-individualist consumer zoo monkeys right now. And we want to break out of that and get back to like homegrown human, team human requires r- responsible, self-reliant folks to make it up. 
Right. I mean, things can grow by distributing outward and laterally rather than coming up with a great new top-down solution. You know, where, where the, the thing that always gets me most nervous when I'm with a gr- group of great activists is when they're saying, okay, how do we get people to anything? It's like, once you're trying to get people to do something, then we're back, you know, figuring out how to do propaganda or, uh, or social control of one sort or another. And it's like, and how dare I be the one who wants to get someone else to do something else. What what I'm looking at now is whether or not sort of the rapture that you're describing or the, 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 you know, the, the apocalypse without the Armageddon, whether that can be a, a gentle unfolding of what is here rather than a, a reaching towards, you know, we don't reach or strive towards apocalypse. We, you know, when you think about, you know, the Buddha or anybody who reaches a, some kind of awakening, it's like, oh, you know, it's not, ah, you know, it's really, it's not the, this, this very Western quest for if we could only get there. And the, the other thing I'm wondering is, has our job changed from, I mean, this is a, a very uh, a, a, a silly way of thinking about it, but uh, or egotistical maybe, but has our job changed from like saving the world to doing palliative care? And what would the difference look like? You know, pallet, you know, it, for for to to help everybody contend with the probable end of our civilization, is you know we go through a mourning period and kind and 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 a slow. How can we be kind kindest about it? How can we have the least amount of pain going into the destruction of the civilization and hopefully, its replacement with something else? Or are we trying to keep this thing? Is it about keeping this thing going? And then what's the difference between what those even, what those even look like? You know, so it's, I'm almost wondering, like, is giving up really such a problem? If giving up just means, okay, you know, we're all going to die, but let's be as nice to each other. Let's make it as painless as possible. Let's, you know, help people experience as much meaning and connection. And, you know, and then maybe we'll surprise ourselves and not, act, not die after all. Yeah, and you're kind of, you know, you're nudging into like Jem Bendel territory and... and- mm right, at everything from deep adaptation to dark mountain to all this kind of stuff. Right. Um, and and, I, and I've, I wrestle with that. I mean, personally, I think I am still nonetheless, like irreducibly some form of like rage against the dying of the light. <laughs> like, like if I'm going to choose, I'm either going to go down surfing or go down swinging, you know, like right. it's, it's one or the other. Um, so I guess a, a, a maybe a both end, we'll see, Right. Um, is the... I mean, really where I'm hanging all my hope at this point is not in the passivity of palliative care, right? But is in the agency of realizing um, the time for cherished outcomes has passed. Right. The, you know, and St. Paul 101, like that it's time to set aside childish things. Mm. And now, and, and I mean, you know, and I've riffed on this with David in the past, but like the notion of what Martin Luther King called soul force, what Gandhi called satyagraha, like that asymmetrical amplifier of human courage, right? Which sends shockwaves through time and space and, and history. If we can all, if normally it's been, it's been one, it's been 10 people. It might've even been the nominal 300 of Leonidas and the Spartans, right? But it's never, it's always been tiny pockets of that, you know, and it has shaped the course of civilization. So can we get to that? And that is the reconciliation of the paradox of like, we're stuffed and there's no way out. So let's make art, right? Let's sing our war song or our love song. And that's the band plays on on the Titanic, right? I mean, we know those poor little, those four bastards, right? And they're like women and children first, captain goes down with his ship. This doesn't end well for me personally. However, therefore I am free to do the only thing that is mine and cannot be taken away, which is, which is make art. Mm-hmm. And that, that redemptive capacity, that's the one I'm, 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 I'm all, I'm all on black. That's, right. That is my last bet and hope and, and ways to do it. Right. The idea of, of radically initiating ourselves and each other into, and someone else in the chat said, what about that Kairos Kronos thing that Jordan was riffing on? Like we're big on that. And that idea of like, if we can come to, a Gnostic embodied initiatory knowing of the nature of things, 
right? And at the same time, not peace out of, of chronos, of clock time, and be fully embodied here. What transformative potential might that hold for us? So that's the one that at least loosely gets me out of bed in the morning. Some days are higher right. than others, but it's the one I keep coming back to, you know? Yeah. And that's, you know, and it's holding on to the, you know, the paradox, paradoxical, paradoxical nature of, of human existence. You know, it's not a circle or a line. It's both, you know, it's not male or female. It's both. It's not progress or, or stasis. It's both. It's not Kairos or Kronos. Again, it's both, but you know, both, both in balance somehow, you know, and that's a, it's tough, you know, it's a tough one. And, and right now the, the, most of the critique that I get is from people who believe that we're already so far gone that the only way out is through. So the topsoil will never be replenished. There's, what do we think? There's 30 harvests left or something in, in global topsoil, unless there was some radical transformation in our permaculture approaches. And they'll say to that, well, that's the reason we need Monsanto all the more. Pedal to the metal. We've got to you know, develop more technologies, more industry, more capitalism, and more growth is the only way you know, to, to, to keep this thing going. And uh, I, had, I hadn't heard that cheery fact. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, oh, anytime. <laughs> 30 harvests. All right. Nice. Just add that one to the list. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, 30 years is so far. That's so far in the future. No. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we, we are, I think we can continue happily exploring this. Just want to check in uh, yeah. with David and Ali. How, how's the questioning going? If there's a bit more. Um, we can yeah, we were going to give you a few more minutes and then come to, we've got a list of, of questions, answers uh, coming up, coming up. Yeah. But if you guys want to want to riff for another five ten, and then we'll. Yeah. I mean, I mean, just to go back to, um, to John Gray, the fellow I mentioned who was taught, you know, who's cautioning against the, 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 the perils of utopian thinking of any mm. strike, right? And, and his, you know, he made that great observation that, you know, even communism is still Christianity with a different, Judeo-Christian Alpha Omega with a different skin. You just strip out the sky god, but you have the proletariat living in sin, and then the inflection point and happily ever after. Mm-hmm. And those happily ever after stories are so, A, seductive, and B, pernicious, because the moment the ends is literally heaven on earth, then the means are always justified to get here. And that's how you get Che Guevara turning from, you know, sexy motorbiking doctor guy to like cold blooded killer. Right. And like that, we've seen that movie. And so one of the things he, he introduced a term I hadn't even heard of before, which was agonistic liberalism, Mm -hmm. right. In the true sort of post enlightenment sense. And the idea of like, we're not ever going to get to singing Kumbaya out of a single hymn book, nor should we even try. That's part of the problem. The idea of agonistic liberalism is we want to preserve the, the, the capacity for the back and forth, for the, for the vigorous debate between, you know, true, again, you know, enlightenment liberalism and conservatism, and then throw in any other hism schisms. And the idea that what we're fighting for is not our preferred outcome or our vision of utopia. What we're fighting for is basically the infinite game and the ability for us all to keep playing it for as long as possible, as generatively as possible, to include as many people as possible. And that honestly does feel at risk right now. It feels like on both sides of the political spectrum, you've got you know, the, the boogaloo folks, I don't know if anybody's tracking this, but like the far alt right who are literally egging on civil war, like they're banking on a second civil war. Like that is, those are death eaters. Let's like, let's just smash this whole fucking thing to the ground. And you have in the most extreme aspects of the left, let's dismantle Western civilization and patriarchy. So on both sides of the political spectrum, you have folks advocating for, for the first time in a century, the finite game winning and blowing up the infinite game of the enlightenment experiment. So for any of us that are agnostic and or humanistic, I think that's the, that's the, meta, that's the meta conflict that we're looking at culturally right now. And right. the weird thing is, as, as all of these eschaton-like things do, is they make strange bedfellows. And the fact of like the most militant S- SJW is actually on the same team as the 4chan troll incel. And you're like, wait a second, how is this happening? And there's that idea that we're sort of entering the intertwingularity, not the singularity. 
And as we go down the drain pipe of, of Kairos, right, and Kronos, like everybody's mythologies, is this the Matrix? Is the Star Wars? Is the, is the evil empire the good guys? Or is that the next 2020 election campaign? Like, I can't tell. And I can't tell whether I'm reading Revelation or I'm reading ISIS's Endgame or I'm reading Hollywood and sci- sci-fi. And it's going to make really strange yeah. bedfellows. Yeah, it's interesting. The, the, the decline of the Star Wars franchise, really, it, it tracks what you're talking about. You know, when George Lucas was doing Star Wars, he really meant, you don't really know, is the, is the Jedi knighthood corrupt? Are they the bad guys? As he was trying to say in the second, se- second three movies, maybe, who really is good? What if Luke had joined with his father to run the universe? Could they have yin-yanged it together? You know, there were the questions. Now, I mean, all Star Wars, there's just bad guys, right? <laughs> bad guys that you kill with, with ray guns. So they really did, uh, uh, they, they lost it. The, the question is whether the Enlightenment experiment, this is, maybe this is just history, is whether the Enlightenment experiment was just so flawed that it was based in the kind of reductionist empirical logic of, of folks like Francis Bacon, that it was so much about um, these kind of platonic ideals. It was so separate from women and people of color and, 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 and the ground that, uh, you know, that, 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 it, that it was incapable, you know, that it just moved to, to the other stuff you're talking about. It moved to, to Hegel and, and Marx and Heidegger and all that stuff. It was so, uh, it was so, it became so idealized and disconnected from just what, what real experience is. You know, it feels I mean, not to say that the people trying to help to save the world are the problem, but in some ways, we are. (laughs) I mean, it's just, at least we're trying to save it in a way that makes people happy as opposed to save it in a way that all black people are gone or all women are slaves or whatever these other visions of, of reality are. But, you know, I'm, I'm trying to kind of unwind from, you know, my own projection of how I want things to be, you know, and it's, it's a lot of what you were talking about. A lot of what you were criticizing before reminded me of when I, I used to speak with Terrence McKenna and I would get really mad at him because I would say, look, you're acting like only people who have had the DMT experience are going to make it through the bottleneck at the end of time. You know, so you better hop on board and have that. So you know how to, and I'm like, no, it's not going to work. George Bush has to come with us. It's like all or none. They were one, one organism. And he's like, I'm sorry, Douglas, but it's just not going to work that way. You know, you know, and, and, so we, our side, such as, such as we are, the, the, the brilliant, well-meaning counterculture can become just as guilty, like you say, of, of the exclu- exclusionary thinking. I guess where I'm stuck is, uh, uh, and maybe it's a fine place to be, but it's almost like any, how do, how do, you, how do you sit with this? You know, how, it's really, it's, this is a hard moment to sit, you know, without feeling like, should we be in the streets? Should we be shouting, shouting a name? Uh, wh- wh- what project? Should I be developing an alternative currency? Should I be, you know, volunteering in school? And then there's only so much one person can do. So do you just do the thing? Do you just, you know, yeah. it's, our, it's, it's a tough moment for that. Well, I mean, that, that, that I think is actually, this, this all builds beautifully, right? Because that notion if we're, I mean, and again, this is a hypothesis that I'm offering. I'm not asserting this as our shared consensus. But if we, if we entertain the idea that actually cherished outcomes and preferred utopian um, uh, destinations are actually part of, structurally part of the problem. So we actually want to commit to some version of agonistic liberalism and the, the capacity for us to expand and extend the infinite game for all of us, including my sworn enemies. Right? The whole, I'll detest what you say, but defend to the death your right to say. Right. Like that general jam right? If we're committing to that, then the other element is um, letting a thousand fires burn. Like what is the psycho-spiritual or sort of neuroanthropological, however you want to frame it, equivalent to blockchain? Hmm. Because what ought we do? There is no singular answer there. And Jordan and I have actually had this, had this conversation in the midst of the COVID thing, because we were all, we got sucked into that, Daniel, Jordan and I, on like a whole bunch of team human projects, like very specific, like PPEs and bread and epidemiological research. And like, it was grinding us into the dirt. And I was like, wait a sec. I was like, I'm an able-bodied, semi-capable human, but I don't think this is mine to do. And, and Jordan in classic Jordan form was like, yeah, this is, you know, instead of talking about Dharma, right. Or some esoteric concept, he's like, this is 
because the, the work ahead is impossibly dense and complex and will not be sufficiently able to be solved by any amount of metabolic effort. Therefore, you should choose what is your Thor's hammer. And like Thor, right, only th like it's infinitely dense and infinitely heavy and impossible to move unless you're fucking Thor. So like that invitation for us is let a thousand fires burn and find your fucking hammer. Because there is something in this world that only you can do and you need to get clear on it and do it. And then let us crowdsource the wisdom and the innovation and the solutions. And some will be metasystemic and some will be grassroots local. Some will just be loving and raising a child or tending a patch in your, a gar in your garden. Like there will be a, a billion, you know, there will be 8 billion or even 50 billion innovations and solutions and 99% of them will snuff it. But among them, somewhere, the, the flame will persist and will catch and will kindle. And that arguably is the best of kind of the free market ethos, which is never, we've never really got to try. The same way Nietzsche said there was only one Christian and they nailed him to a tree. We've never, you know, like free the market, free the market of economics, free the market of ideas, of innovation, of entrepreneurship, and of, you know, future proofing. But let us all get on it. Right. I mean, and once you free the market, that's when the monopolies crumble and you get the distributed local bottom up, everybody, uh, not everybody necessarily doing their own thing, but you, you, you scale solutions appropriately to where they are rather than force, force them. You know, and it's also important, I mean, I think for, for a lot of us who are trying to, to improve things is to realize that sometimes small victories are the best ones. You know, there, I feel like so many young people are worried about, well, then how do I get more followers? How do I get more likes on that? How do I grow this thing? How do I, you know, rather than just doing something, they want to create the website that aggregates all the people who are then doing that thing or the website that aggregates the websites that are aggregating. Everyone wants to, you know, become the thing. And I understand if you don't have the million people on Twitter saying, yeah, it feels like it hasn't happened, but that's such a... Um, that's such a, a, a silly road to go down. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it, it, and it, it's, it's so much easier to find gratification and, and to see the, the results of what you're doing when it's the, you know, the smile on the kid that you've taught to read or, you know, the, 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 the land that you've replenished, you know, it's just, it's so much, there, there's so much real work to be done that these sort of abstracted solutions are, I mean, that's why it's tricky for us as two accomplished white male intellectuals with published books and all to say, oh, don't, you know, <laughs> don't stand in front of crowds with your solution. I mean, it's part of why I've been feeling hypocritical lately as whatever this is, public intellectual. It's part of why I want to just like be a teacher and, and, and help people locally. It's not to say I'm done, but it's like it's, there, there, there's enough other ideas and other people. So I just want to stay, somehow stay in service rather than in uh, uh, whatever whatever the the opposite is, yeah, right. So we're going to throw in the first answer from the the unpanel, and but if you could do a, another Terence McKenna impression at some point during the rest of the, the talk, <laughs> Douglas, I think everyone would appreciate that. That went down really well. That that, that high pitched psychedelic whine, yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> So, Ali, I think the first is Rain Revere. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Cool. Um, I, uh, I responded to the question that was posed by bringing up uh, death and our relationship with death and really our relationship with mortality. Um, what are resource constraints if we're not playing the immortality game anymore? You mean if we don't want to live forever? Yeah, I think the question is uh, how how um, how much are those game theoretic competitive um, aspects of society that we're seeing part of this conscious and unconscious drive for immortality, and um, yeah, does how important is a relationship with death and mortality to be able to widen and not be seeking that end game. Yeah. I'd say absolutely non-negotiably essential. So like, I don't think we actually get to soul force until you've met your maker, until you've actually reconciled with dying. And I share this quote all the time because it 
literally guides my life at this point, but it's Wendell Berry, and he uses that phrase, practice resurrection. So the idea of like, you know, in, 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 in sports science, there's the notion of like the last mile problem or conundrum, which is how marathoners will run clockwork five minute miles. And then they'll get inside the stadium and see the finish tape and their final mile, they'll suddenly run a sub five minute mile, even though they're exhausted. And you're like, what the hell is that? And what it is consistently is some neurophysiological and psychological buffer in our system that says, don't spend it all. You will die. And once we know we are safe, then we have extra. We have this reserve tank. It's the same way when if you try and hold your breath underwater and you think you have to breathe, you're actually only at about 40% of your maximum breath hold. But all the safety buffers are like, mayday, mayday, get a gulp or you're going to drown. So by some form, by hook or crook, right, either life and hard knocks or initiatory deliberate practice, like in cultivate death practices, such that like the samurai idea of like meditate a thousand ways to die. So when you're on the battlefield, you are undivided in your attention. Like it feels like we have to have already reconciled with our mortality to be able to source an offer from love in a, tr in a truly like exponentially transformative way. So absolutely, right. I mean, I think, I think that's the non-negotiable one. And I, we are absolutely a death phobic culture. We ship our elders off to be cared for at minimum wage by strangers on, and, you know, and, and our elders are on drugged up and we poke and prod each other with botulism, toxin and fillers to pretend we're not aging. So like, yes, <laughs> like hundred percent bring dying back uh, and make it a central part of um, our orientation to how we live. Yeah, I mean, I got I got to deal with death a lot, just from people I know, you know, dying and and being with them and thinking about it. And then, um, you know, Timothy Leary tried to do a a kind of a design for dying around around his death. And interestingly, he kind of abandoned that trip as it got close to the end and it got really serious. He was like, "Oh, fuck this! I just gonna I got to really deal with dying here." It was in, and it was interesting to see, you know. I, the show is over. I can't do death as a show. I'm actually, I'm not going to freeze my brain. I'm not doing this. I'm going to deal with dying. Um, and I feel okay about dying. But then, I mean, what I've been concerned about is the, the death of our civilization or the death of, of, of our species or the death of life itself. And trying to apply the same understandings of resurrection to, to that or return or the, the eternal return to civilization and then I um, interviewed James Lovelock a few months ago, who's 100 years old, the Gaia hypothesis guy. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, well, because the sun is so much hotter now than it was when life started on Earth back when, um, if we reached the tipping point and it got too hot for life on Earth and Earth, life on Earth died, we no longer have the conditions for life to start again. That 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 he believes that the, the 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 maintenance of the appropriate temperature for biology as we know it to exist on this planet um, is is very it's a delicate system and it's it it's in it's in danger. So then I started to think about well, what if everything dies, right? What if life on Earth dies, and what if it turns out that this was the only life in the universe, and it turns out that the the, the only life in the universe was the universe's only bit of self awareness? So what if it's really dying. And do we, how do we, how do we, you know, how does one come to terms with that? And it's just so, for me, it's again, it's so hopelessly linear. It's so different from the sustainable circular reincarnation, you know, uh, uh, imitation of the gods sort of myth of eternal return that, that, that indigenous people had and that I'm trying to, 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 you know, kind of adopt, adopt myself as a little Western linear person. But uh, I'm trying, I feel like even if we're, even if we are going to go on and it is going to be okay, we've got to even uh, as a, as a society, as a civilization, we've got to contend, we've got to accept that possibility as well, accept the, the, that, you know, yes, I'm playing the infinite game, but infinity might not be mine. You know, <laughs> we might not, it's, it's, you play it and keep it going as long as we can keep that, you know, that hacky sack up in the air as long as we can as a, as a, as a species. But um, also accept that if, if we are temporary, what, what is, what is that then, you know, and, 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 you know, what does that mean for our, for our, 
you know, I've been reading Levinas lately. He's a really interesting guy. Um, and he basically says that all we've really got is our comportment. It's how you comport yourself is really all that you can, all that you can know. How do you engage with the other and how do you expand? You know, Timothy Leary was the one who had the quote, find the others, but he meant find the other cool psychedelic people. And then when I've retrieved, find the others, I mean, find the others, find, you know, the MAGA hat wearing scary people that you don't really think you like and find the human in them. And then I just met an indigenous man who was like, no, the others are the other species. It's not the other, you've got way more, you've got everything in common with that Trump supporter. You think you're different from him? It's like, start recognizing the others that you're trampling on. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm playing with that too, but just expanding our, our notions of, of, of self and, and supposed other um, play into these real uh, uh, misperceptions and fear uh, and fear of death. Which I, but I, I totally agree. It's that it's it's essential. I mean, Becker was writing about it, and and really he nailed it, right? And now it, so much of our everything we do, all those billionaires we were talking about, they're just scared to die. They're really just scared to die, and they do so much. Um, you know, you're 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 absolutely right. And when you're not, because the fact is, all that gamification, you know, as we they showed when they tried to recreate the prisoner's dilemma experiments, they never work. They never work. People never behave that way. They, they never do the thing that, um, who was it? Um, what was his name? The game theorist, the schizophrenic who, uh, John, John Nash. Nash. Yeah. John Nash, who came up with him. And later he said, look, I was a paranoid schizophrenic coming up with these ideas. This is not, a, this is not the normal human response. Um, but yeah, but when you are afraid, I mean, it's certainly in the, in the big picture, when we're afraid of death. Sure. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to gather. We're not going to trust that the mana is coming from heaven the next day. And uh, you know, well, you get, you get worms. Yeah. I love the, the prisoner's dilemma. I think the only people that did the prisoner's dilemma in that way were economists because they'd been taught that that's what they were supposed to have done. Right. Um, so we've next up is Gordon Young. You had an answer to the question. Yes. Yeah. So um, the problem posed by the question is how do we deal with limited resources or resource constraints? And uh, the the issue with that, um, or or one way around it, is recognition that the best things in life aren't things. Right? That that uh, once we get past a certain level of of resource, that um, the things that we value, we're valuing them for the ability to um, to make our lives better, but but not necessarily by making our lives better in a material sense. And so, um, in some ways, it was a, a um, an easy answer, uh, you know, a banal answer to the question. But I think the part that's that um, merits a lot of contemplation is how do you how do you awaken that recognition for people um especially in this culture that we're you know in our western culture but i don't think it's our western industrial information culture i think it's um i think there's a lot of sort of genetic evolutionary bias um towards individual uh, trying to trying to get more, right? How much money is enough? Well, just a little bit more was John D. Rockefeller's answer, right? So how much, uh, you know, how, how do you know you're wealthy enough? Well, when I when I can afford better toys than my brother-in-law, right? Um, well, there's there's some pretty innate forces that drive us towards this material grasping. So the the question I think that's that's really interesting is how do we how do we awaken that recognition individually for ourselves and for the people around us and the, the culture and the you know seven and a half billion of us that are on this planet? Um, I think uh, you know the, the event is coming unless we do awaken this kind of recognition. And so I think that's where the, where's the growing edge? How to how to propagate that understanding uh, that there's there's more to life than just the material. I don't have any answers for it, I'd, <laughs> but um, uh, that's that's why I'm here is to to talk about it with other people. So, hope that sparks some other interesting conversation. Yeah, and I mean, you know, that is that's the kind of 
those are those are the shallow waters we're all running aground in in the kind of personal growth and transformation space, right? Because people are like, oh wait, I'm 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 grinding and I'm chasing material stuff, and then I listen to Eckhart Tolle or or, or, or whatever. I drop acid or I go to Burning Man, and I'm like, hey, we're all one. It's groovy, and I'm gonna hold this as long as I possibly can until wham, 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 and now I'm pulled down again <clears throat> to my material seeking, striving, animal self. And my sense is that if we want something to work, we have to fully acknowledge the better angels of our nature, but also the baser animal. And we actually have to meet both because you can't just go fucking cross-eyed and pretend, you know, hypothermic don't make good poets, right? I mean, there's just basic hierarchy of evolutionary biology and coding competition, et cetera. And so my sense would be is that the, like, cause the question that we've posed, which is how do we play well together? when the stakes are high and there's a ton of in, like attempts or efforts for us to gel together and do this hard thing. And we fragment and we fragment, it feels to me at the top and we fragment at the bottom. So we fragment with the large number of people that try to come together on behalf of a bigger cause. And there needs to be some basic version of, hey, I mean, UBI is a contemporary expression of it, but basically we find a way to meet everybody's basic needs so that striving for competition and advancement and one up one down relationships is at least hypothetically off the table. Now there's the multipolar trap in game theory, which is if someone's going to rush to break the, the pact, then it might as well be me. Right. And then you get shitty sociopathic behavior again, simply without even having to have a sociopath in the mix. It's just, I suspect someone else might be therefore I will act to protect my own interests. So I remember in grad school, reading a case study of the 19th century range wars in northern New Mexico. And it was this fascinating story. If you guys don't, this is when the cowboys were like fencing everything. And it was basically a pitched battle between the Hispanic sheep herding communities and the Anglo cattle companies, right? And, and it was, you know, and the cattle companies were going around and killing all, the, killing all the Hispanic folks and fencing everything for their cattle. Super bloody, crazy conflict. But what was fascinating is that in the Hispanic mountain communities where there was limited resources, this was high alpine, not super lush, kind of sketchy, was that within those villages, there was explicit social shaming against individually taking more than your fair share. So there was net, like if one goat herder started basically trashing the commons in order to asymmetrically gather capital, right, in the form of a bigger, a bigger flock or whatever, they were actually socially shunned and shamed. That would be the kind of thing their mother would take them aside and don't be an asshat, what are you doing, right? Or their friends would maybe distance them or tease them or something along those lines. And so some version of a UBI, and this could be in an intentional community, this could be in an urban environment, it's all the way to a nation state, but some form of that, and then some form of healthy pro-social shaming, which is different than guilt. And I know there's different and conflicting definitions of this term, but the idea of like guilt is, is unhealthy. That's me, I'm not worthy. But shame is I have transgressed the, the highest norms of my society, of my in-group, and I am responsible for atoning for them. And if we have that at the base layer, is there a chance for us to, you know, to basically renormalize the commons and pro-social behavior? So I'll leave it at that. There's, there's also a tops down element, which is how do you take the, the most awake charismatic transmission folks and how do you get them to play well together, which is another nut to crack, but we can come back to it if it pops up. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, and, and as you know, you know, until now, the, most of the, most of the social shaming is being done by the, the, the wicked on the good, you know, to make us, you know, shameful about, about, you know, sex or gender or whatever, you know, that, that we, we carry around shame and the truly shameless people uh, uh, the people who do the shameful stuff are shameless you know, <laughs> right now. It's not even, it's not even, uh, 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 they, they don't, they don't seem to, they don't seem to care, but, but I agree, you know, the, the, you know, my work has always been about trying to reveal the underlying operating systems that people accept as given conditions of, of nature, but are actually inventions. So uh, central currency, everybody thinks, okay, money. So how are we going to get more money to more people and this? And it's like, you know, and some of us are challenging, well, what is money? What kind of money are we using? What's the, what are the rules of this money compared to a let system or time dollars or something that doesn't have interest and have to grow? And, um, 
you know, what if we created money that was that was optimized for the velocity of, of currency rather than the extraction of capital? And what would that look like? And you go back and you start reading the moral philosophers like uh, Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill, and you see that they were actually thinking the way we are, even though they've been become the patron saints of, you know, the economist and neoliberalism, you know, they, they no more believed in that than Darwin believed in, in competition as the only path, uh, the only path of evolution. So uh, I'm, I'm feeling like the, the, the path is the retrieval of really largely medieval economic uh, uh mechanisms, you know, the, the commons and market monies and local currencies and let people experiment with those in, you know, in their, you know, high, small local ways, and then, and then hopefully see them, see them expand out. I mean, subsidiarity is the answer to the last two questions in some ways. Subsidiarity was a, a, a sort of an economic principle that said no business needs to, should grow no business should grow larger than it needs to in order to conduct its business. You don't grow for growth's sake. You Joe makes his pizzeria, it serves his community, and the next town gets its own pizzeria. And that's actually more resilient because then if he runs out of dough, he can call Mary in the next town and say, you've got extra dough. I'm running out here. It's not, uh, 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 it's not his uh, pizzeria anymore. So these, these, uh, you know, these, models, these models exist. It's just right now, you know, when I talk to, you know, suppose people in power, I guess, or people who, who seem to be able to implement some of them on larger scales, they, they really don't believe they're possible. They're so, uh, uh, the, the, the laws of, of scarcity-based central currency, you know, profit, capital, uh, economics are so embedded, they haven't read their history. They don't even know that these things, uh, that these things are possible. You know, UBI works out mathematically. It just doesn't work in, in their understanding of, uh, uh, of how money works. So we've got uh, maybe time for one or two more, but uh, Dave Pendle, could we get your answer to the question? I was uh, sensing, or I, I've had an experience of a collective awakening that is enlightenment beyond the individual. So it seems to be if there's a, rec a deep recognition, an embodied recognition of interdependence on others and the system and the earth, that seems to be a way to shift consciousness away from purely preoccupation with survival. I'd buy that. I mean, you were not, you're not alone, you know, is the way I've been trying to say, tell it to people. You're not alone. This is a, this, you know, being human is a team sport, you know, and, it, and, and, it's so much easier when you do that, but people are still, I don't know when, you know, I'm not a, a psychologist, but you know, there's this, there's this terrible twos phase, you know, where the child, where the baby realizes it's really separate from its mother and it has the ability to say no. And it experiences itself or himself, herself as, as a distinct, and it's an important stage for the baby to go through as distinct. Then, you know, certainly by the time they're adolescent, then they want to reconnect with all those, you know, and become one with all these other, with all these other people. And I feel like we've, um, our civilization's gotten stuck in, in that cult of, of individuality that we only feel, you know, truly alive or truly flourishing if we are, uh, you know, somehow uh, manifesting individually. And it's, uh, um, it's a shame. It's a shame, but maybe that's breaking down, you know, maybe we're going to, you know, reach, we're going to reach that adolescent stage and and start to start to realize that that there's the potential for a party here, you know. I mean, that's part of what you know the the beauty of what the the even even in it even at Burning Man even at you know whatever gathering whatever weird psychedelic you know rave that you're at however commercial and however silly and even if Eric Schmidt comes, um, it doesn't mean that there's not the possibility for. That, that waking up that, oh, my God, it's so much more fun with other people. And once you get there, at least you're starting on the way. You know, poor Maslow, you know, putting, putting self-actualization at, at the top of the pyramid, you know, it, it, it created a detour for a lot of us into this idea of self-improvement and, um, uh, you know, this whole self-help movement. And you go to Esalen and sit in your little thing and, and, and manifest as as yourself there's such a um it, it just dovetailed so 
easily with the me generation and and consumerism and personal empowerment and and then the cosmos and life extension and my life life extension not of our planet but life extension of me and I'm going to upload my brain to that computer and um, it's uh, it, it's it's that's our side getting a little silly about this stuff too. But yeah, I totally agree. Once you break down the barrier and realize you're not alone in this trip, that you've been, you've been connected to all these other people the whole time, um, it becomes, I think, a little bit easier to, to manifest in some of the ways that we're, we're suggesting. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And, and, and then for anybody that isn't already familiar with Scott Barry Kaufman's work, he was a protege of Seligman at Penn. He's now at Columbia. I think he's a, he's a buddy and he just published a book called Transcend, which is about Maslow's unpublished lost papers. And the fact mm. that the cherry on top of the pyramid was not actualization. It was transformation, meaning in Maslow's terms, service, service. Oh. So the fact that we spent 30 or 40 years and the entire boomer generation went barking off, you know, to narcissistic self-indulgence is one thing. And then Dave, to your point, I mean, yes, wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice? Beach boys, right? I mean, if we all found that we had unity consciousness and we were connected to source, right? Mm -hmm. And we could all manifest from there. Yes. But then the next, the next crux is who the fuck grabs the one ring of power? Because like it, it's magic and it's potent. And then, the, so let's just say, let's just telescope ahead. Okay, yes, that's possible. It's reproducible, it's scalable. And a shit pile of people are doing it all at once right now. And how do we learn to play together once people are actually tapping in to the mainframe? And because, mm. because you know, Lord Acton 101, absolute power corrupts, right? So the notion, so when I, I posited that bottoms up, like UBI plus yeah. healthy social shame as a way for us to manage the, excess grasping of game theory drivers and the positioning and the jockeying. And someone in the comments had mentioned, in addition to that, Hispanic sheep herding, social norm. There's also the, particularly in the Pacific Northwest tribes, the notion of the potlatch, which is that when I accumulate wealth, I actually accrue status, not by holding it and hoarding it like the dragon smog, right? But actually by gifting it and putting the velocity of wealth back into my society. Mm -hmm. So it's almost sort of like an indigenous version of Metcalfe law. Like I actually gain power within the network, right? By dis redistributing and reallocating resources versus hoarding. So that's super neat. But the tops down one is, is as or more problematic, which is, you know, a conversation I think we've all been having in this, you know, on rebel wisdom and elsewhere, you know, which is why is it that people that are sourcing from that place tend as a rule not to play well with others? Yeah. And how the hell do we actually bomb this together? And one of it, it feels like, because because up until now, the waking up process or the actualizing process has been largely individual and catch as catch can. So we're all like apex predators, like panthers, and we all need 400 square miles of territory. And you try and put, you know, you put a dozen panthers in a pen together and it's a shit show, you know, versus if you guys saw that documentary Blackfish, right, about, about orca pods, like they've, they've got bigger brains than we do and that the, all the extra folds are for social coherence. So they literally have anatomically, they are hardwired to, they are apex predators too, the wolves of the sea, they're badasses, but some, they have figured out how to play this game. And so for me, that's the true missing link. And, and I mean, lots of efforts in the last five years of coming together with smart, brilliant intention, you know, like Dharma holders or whatever, they've all got their superpower and the superheroes cannot get it fucking done. And so one proposed solution would be the idea of like, can we, can we see each other's light from each other's light, right? Without getting pushed away from each other by seeing each other's shadow or fallibility or humanity. Mm -hmm. And so if you find as a thought experiment, like who's your 12? Like find your dozen and think about the people that are closest in your life and think about the beautiful, perfect part of them that is their expression. It could be they're always the humorous one. They're always the adventuresome one. They're always the emotionally intelligent one. This is the creative harebrained idea when like, I love you fully and wholly for that. In that expression, when you're on that, you are perfect, right? And that's awesome because we can love each other up. But then there's also the element of, well, hey, rather than some of us getting kind of sort of most of the way there, and whether it's pressure from the marketplace or Instagram or whatever, we start fronting that we're all the way there. We actually say, what if we assemble from this dozen that is our carass, right, as Vonnegut would call it, right, our crew, 
that we say we take your slice of the divine, we take your slice of the divine, this, your slice, your slice, and we assemble Voltron, we assemble perfected human. That is the sum total and mediated by all of our relationships, which is we express via agape, like I fucking love you because I see the perfected in you, but none of us grab the ring. That's a non-starter, but between us, we can hold and metabolize perfected human and we can, we can transfer all worship, right? Sacrifice, dedication, loyalty to that hologram that is the one, right? Held and metabolized by the 12. And can we use that as a way to precipitate what Tila de Chardin called the, you know, the Omega point, like the body of Christ, de Chardin said, is the second coming at the end of time that is all of us as Omegans. Right. I don't go to Omega, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's nice. It's nice. I mean, I guess I don't believe the ring actually has power. That was super Woody Allen of you right there. By the okay, way. good. I try. It's better than Terrence in some ways. It's closer <laughs> to my origins. But the, the, the ring, I look at the ring as social construction. You know, again, from, from Torah, it's like uh, 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 Samuel goes to God and says, everybody wants a king. They want a king. Everyone else has a king. Now the Jews, the Israelites, they want a king. What do I do? And God, he, that God's like, they, no, no, we don't do kings. That's not, that's not what we do because it's about power and all. You know, we don't do that. And Samuel's like, look, they're really, they're not going to, they're not going to behave. They really, really want a king. And God says, all right, pick the tallest guy. Pick the tallest guy. As if it's just like, it doesn't, just pick some dude. You know, at that point, it was all dudes. You know, you should have picked a woman. But, but pick the tallest one, put the crown on so they know it's the king. The whole idea is the crown to me, the crown is about the opposite of power, that the crown is saying the only reason why this person gets to be king is because they're wearing the crown. It's a total social construction. We're going to pretend like this guy is something when he's actually not in order to just administrate what we're doing. And, and we've, you know, we've fallen into the trap of feeling like our, our kings are actually powerful, that they've got, that they've got something where, you know, I prefer almost the, uh, the kind of the revelation and eyes wide shut when Sidney Pollack basically reveals as the head of the big secret, great Illuminati cabal, that he's just an administrator. You know, it's, it's just something we got to do every year. It's just, you know, this is just, that's all they are. They're just administrators. But anyway, it was just because when you were talking about the ring, I, I wonder, but we can empower it. Certainly if we focus on, on that power, we can in, in, invest power in it. I believe in magic. I mean, I think it'll it'll go there, but if we started to see leadership as this other as a social construction, it'd be so much um, easier to deal with. Yeah, well, and, and you've, you've hinted at it several times uh, today, Doug. You, you've mentioned most most often a guy when you're kind of talking about the old Judeo Christian story, and you're like, often dudes here doing this and that and the other, and, and it should have been a woman. Um, so in in a in another like bit of culture architecture, mm. it feels like a really healthy thing. In addition to the basic needs met and potentially pro-social shaming and, and built-in mechanisms for redistribution of, of excess resources and all that kind of potlatch notion. Another potential is literally like the grandmother's council, hmm. right? Because, you know, Jared Diamond writes about this, like menopause is, is very rare in nature and is actually an adaptive trait, and even in the primates broadly. And it's, and it's, it's, almost, it's one of the more unique things, including mating outside of estrus and this kind of stuff that humans have. And the adaptive reasoning is that, hey, grandmothers actually provide um, evolutionary advantage by bestowing wisdom and helping raise the tribe. And the idea that because they're no longer in the procreation game, which is arguably the root game theory play, because they're outside of that, they have the capacity to hold wisdom for the collective in a way that virtually no one else does. And so, you know, the Iroquois Council had that. They, they had that sitting above the war chieftains. And the war chieftains would have to go to the grandmother's council and be like, can we go whack those dudes? And they'd be like, you could, but if you lose any of our boys, you're going to have to go back and now we're in a blood feud. And like, don't fuck it up. So rather than like attrition and this kind of stuff, they had to be seamless. So like men, I would submit, are really good at three things. We're good at fighting stuff, fucking stuff, and building stuff. But why to fight and who to fuck and what to build, we're terrible at. Hmm. And so anchoring that counterbalance, right, with, with, with a council of grandmothers feels like it could be a, a, you know, a relatively shorter path to a bunch of solves. 
So we're, we've got about 10 minutes left, just a bit less than 10 minutes left. So I was going to give uh, Douglas and Jamie the opportunity for something that you haven't, uh, a question you haven't asked or something you wanted to say. I'd, I'd like to throw something in and you can take this or you can go with something different. Just that with both of your work, the, the similarity, you've both kind of looked at transformational culture, psychedelic cultures, potentially having a lot of the answers, like as a, as a source of, of hope for culture. And you've both, to some degree, I think, come out in a, in a, in a less hopeful place. I'm, I'm interested, do you still have hope for that, for that, those tools, um, that, that part of culture or not? Where, where have you ended up? I mean, I have, I have hope. In some ways, I think I have more real hope than I did before. I just don't have climactic hope. You know, I don't have big hope. I don't have spectacle hope. I've got, you know, I've got small age hope, you know, which, <laughs> which is in some ways it's, it's, I mean, I used to believe with Terrence that, you know, we're doing something that, or, 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 um, you know, Deschardins, that humanity is evolving to the next phase. And you just as a, you know, a water boils and reaches complexity, that humanity is moving to the next fractal level of awareness. The, the collective holographic mind is about to be realized. And then internet is the trial run and psychedelics are the lubricant. And now, you know, you will, as Terrence used to say, you will literally be able to see what I mean. And that was the way he talked about it, that we'd go like squid into a, into a virtual psychedelic virtual reality collective thing. And um, as an adolescent or a young man, I was like, yeah, you know, let's go there. Let's reach it. Let's find it. And um, I was always a little questioning, even in the first book, Siberia. I'm like, is this the philosopher's stone or is the philosopher merely stoned? You know, and I would even back then in my most idealistic, I was open to, to are they right? Is, are you serious? Really? You know, the friggin', you know, Andy Warhol of the 21st century, or is this just a bunch of people stoned? What's, what's going on? And, and uh, I, I find myself in some ways almost, almost less cynical than I was then because I'm no longer evaluating whether humanity is about to rise from the chrysalis of matter into pure consciousness before the weight of capitalism takes us down. And I'm much more interested in, um, you know, these, these tiny relationships between people and maybe it's fantasy or maybe it's not, but this sense that when I make genuine eye contact and establish rapport with just one other person, that that is trickling out, whether it's quantum or God or something else, that that is my whole universe at that moment. And it's not, um, it's not nothing. It's not white privilege. It's not, um, it's not a psychedelic fantasy. It's real and it's happening in, in my path, you know, and that, that, if that if that doesn't uh, that may scale better than the whatever forty thousand copies of some book that I've written and have traveled around, you know that that that, that it's fine. Write the book and it's fine and it's entertainment. I just don't know if the knowledge production and sort of industrial age spread of all this stuff is really more meaningful than than that than that tiny. Yeah, yeah, and I, I mean, and I, and I think we're very much. Um, exploring the same things about sort of, you know, is it a, is it a wave? Is it a particle? Is it a hockey stick redemption curve or is it an endless cycle of life? Right? <laughs> it's a great way to say it. Yeah. A, poly, a polychronic quantum epistemology holds all of them and says, Hey, reality collapses based on the lens you lay over it. And I think there's my strong hunch right now is that yes, there is that hockey stick curve, but if you zoom and, and it feels like we're accelerating right up the knee of it to some omega point, but we'll get there and realize you, you zoom out, you realize, oh, this was actually just an arc. This was just a piece of what is in fact a full circle. Right. And it's a full circle on civilizational rise and fall, like Ozymandias 101, look upon my works, ye mighty, or, 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 or Charlton Heston and the Planet of the Apes with, you know, the Statue of Liberty buried up to it, you know, buried in sand. Like we will realize, hey, man, bigger civilizations, more complex shit has come and gone, um, both on this little blue marble and off it. And we are all just wheels within wheels. And at the same time, the transformational point, that omega point, I do still feel is there too, which is 
not that we get to peace out and it's, and it's the, the rapture escape, but that we actually get to become twice born. So to range to your question about death and mortality, like when we die to ourselves and our preferences, you know, and our stories in this life and still in this body, and we get to be twice born, right? As a homegrown human on team human, then we realize we come back all the way to exactly what you were talking about, Doug, which is the fucking here and now. My family, this rocking chair, that garden, right? And the, and the, and the hope you have that phrase, right? That whenever, whenever there'd be the blowhard dude sitting around the Kiva, you know, some, some grandmother would be like, yeah, but does it grow corn? Hmm. And so we can come home full circle like Dorothy, having gone on that heroic transformative path to realize with fresh eyes and for the first time, there is no place like home. And this is it. Mm. And this is everything. So that the starlight and the transcendence is, is perpetual and timeless. It's, it's opposable thumbs and eight or nine decades to do this human thing that is the embodied miracle and both worth fighting for passionately, right? And allowing to be what it must. Like where Castaneda like talks about with Don Juan, he says, you know, he says the, the warrior's task is to do what he must knowing it is futile and to do it anyway. His is the act of controlled folly. And once we've, once we're, once we've swallowed that one, then it's all fun and it's all art. Awesome. Fantastic wrap up from you both. Thank you so much for um, that really free ranging conversation and for, for bringing it back down to earth at the end. And, and it sort of, it was back down to earth and it was cosmic at the same time. So thank you. And, and for the, the second Terence impression as well, Douglas. <laughs> you asked. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. This was one of the talks from the Rebel Wisdom Festival. A dozen more films from the festival are available in our members area from John Viveki, Jordan Hall, Nora Bateson, Jamie Wheel, Douglas Rushkoff and many more. So become a Rebel Wisdom member and get access to loads of exclusive films and join the Rebel Wisdom community for sense-making calls, our wisdom gym and more. We're also running our online course again soon, Sense Making 101, with faculty including Daniel Schmachtenberger. Check out the website for more.